call this operations meeting to order. Um, okay. Yes. So, no, I have it right here. I'm sorry. sorry. I had the wrong agenda. Um, so, know. item number one, discussion and approval of the committee meeting minutes. Uh, do I have a, a motion to approve? No. no. Consensus. Oh, consensus. But consensus. you just want to call out the uh, specific dates of the... Thank um, you. Yeah. I apologize. I'm on like two hours. That's okay. So. And you might want to just make sure your mic's on. It is. Is it not? Mm -hmm. I would just really lean in. All right. Yeah. Okay. So operation, take consensus on operation committee meeting minutes for January 18th, 2017, January 25th, 2017, and February 13th, 2017. Yes, Karen. I, uh, I just want to note that I had a, a correction on the February 13th minutes, which I have given to the superintendent. Okay. So um, consensus with the um, changes? Yes. 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 And yes. Item number two, the cafeteria uh, financial report. Yeah, just uh, as you have a copy of it, uh, through uh, February, with the Board of Ed, uh, taking out the Board of Ed uh, assistance, uh, there's a uh, $35,000, $165 loss. If the uh, Board of Ed's in there, it would be a gain. Let me just go over a couple of things. We also want to project from now, from uh, March to the end of the year, if you look at the difference between income and expense, it's about a $311 uh, loss every day times the 61 days would be $18,000 roughly uh, rest of the year loss. So the total loss for the year would be $54,000. Less the uh, uh, Board of Ed assistance of $38,000 would be a uh, projected loss of $15,424. That compares to our uh, projected 1617 that we have in the budget, uh, we uh, put that at a $12,000 gain at the end of the year. If you look at both uh, with the loss of 15,000 and reduce the, uh, uh, we have a, still, we haven't used $119,000 uh, uh, set aside, we would have a reserve of 104,000. Again, each month changes and so forth. So right now, if we uh, use our figures, we would have a, a net loss of 15,004, and we would use uh, uh, some of that against 119, so we would have $104,000 reserve going into next year. Uh, next year, as it's in the budget, uh, there is a uh, proposed loss of 58,000, uh, a proposed assistance from the Board of Ed of 80,000, would give us uh, a gain of 21,000. Now, if you add the 21,000 and the 104,000, which we're not, uh, we're not gonna touch next year because of the gain, we would have a balance of $125,000 in next year's if everything went according to uh, oil, as we say. So as you, uh, again, if you look at the, uh, the difference between 15, 16, 16, 17 at this point. The loss at 1516 was 101,000. The loss at this point is 35,000. So you see we've gained uh, a number of things, especially income per day. Went up from uh, uh, 8,400 to 8,900, and our expenses went down from 9,300 to 9,200. So that's, uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, Alan wants to say anything? Well, I, I do want to say a few things, and but I'll answer anything for the uh, financial end, but I ha as you notice, I have some of my staff out there, and I am extremely satisfied that uh, we went through a state audit, and the state audit, we uh, did very well. Uh, we got hard mar marks with the, all the material done in the office with the free and reduced pricing, our accountability, and our uh, claiming, and I want to thank uh, Karen and Marcia for all that work. We had one school that during, and everybody gets nervous during these audits, but uh, one school was perfect that I asked them to come tonight. Sue and uh, Fran, raise your hand. Rock Hill School, when the state went there, they were extremely impressed with the way that they were serving the children. The other two schools that reviewed were Lyman Hall and uh, Holy Trinity, which also got very high marks, and I commend all of our staff because they all work together. Not only are things done right only in those schools, but when I go around the schools, we make sure that the things are done 
perfectly in all the other schools. So if the state didn't find any findings, and at the end of the conference, we had a very nice exit conference, they gave me some even better ideas. And looking forward, if the forward is here, uh, we will make those changes. And they're just, you know, physical looking changes and things like that. But as far as what we're serving, our nutritional balance, our nutritional books were excellent, and our recipes, and they all match up, and uh, we're raring to go. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you have on the financial also at this time. Yes. Jay? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it was the last meeting, a recent meeting. Anyhow, we had talked about the number of students um, that qualify for free and reduced lunch that were not participating in it, and we were going to try to reach out to, to the parents. Yeah, well, Can you tell I me how we're making out with that? I don't know if it's a reach out to the parents. What we try to do is, um, Karen's going to help me put out it like a uh, flash email on it, uh, is to get to meet more. But currently, 70% of the children on free and reduced are reading. And a lot of it has to do with menu variety. And as you know, we did add pizza to the menu. Now our elementary schools they actually have four choices. It's too early to say if that's increasing the counts or the participation, because if you're offering that many choices, I mean, these are young adults, you're making a change. We did always serve pizza in the high school, so really there's really gonna be no change there. But uh, we're finding uh, excitement in the middle schools that they do have the ability to get pizza every day. And as those numbers come in, I'll, as we go down the road, I could report better numbers, but mm -hmm. we've only been in it for three oh, so years. So we're not reaching out to the Well, to the I, parents I don't, I personally don't know if I would do that. I mean, if the board directs me to do that, I would. I mean, we do it at the register and encourage, but I think sending out an email like that would. Well, how do, I guess, how do we know? How do we know they would qualify, but they're not? They get a letter. They receive a letter. When they when they are approved by my office, and uh, if they haven't applied, Jay, how would I think you, Jay's would question was qualified, not yeah. approved. So, oh. um, I think that what has always been the case, and I understand where Alan is coming from in the sense that it's a sensitive issue. So, yeah, no, I, I, um, I understand. You know, you so we what they traditionally have done is sent out email blasts, or well, I think that's more recent. Um, but on the back of the menus on the website, it talks about what does it mean to qualify for free reduced lunch. Um, so I think the more we can continue to do that, um, I think the better that we can. I, I think that what we could do is beyond doing the email blast, the blurb that you put as an email blast, okay. you could also send that to all the principals to make sure they put it in their monthly newsletters um, that goes home. Um, I think that would be a helpful piece um, because we're finding that sometimes parents, depending, parents respond to communication very differently. So mm -hmm. some read everything that the principal sends and ignore everything else because they're just overwhelmed and they feel that the principal is going to tell me what I need to know about my child's classroom, which I totally agree with. Um, so we could do the principal newsletter. You can continue to put it on the menu, um, potentially. It's, it is always on the menu. Right? So that's there, and then the email blast. So I think those are, those are really good means. Yes, Kathy? Uh, so when we put it on the, the back of the menu, is, do we, spe do we um, emphasize the fact this is very confidential? That they're, because I'm very concerned that there's a lot of parents that don't take advantage of this because of the stigma attached with it. I, I want them to know that there is no, that it's very highly confidential. I, there's no reason point. for them not to apply. I, I will add point. that okay. to that. But and, and what we also do is put a phone number and uh, they call the office and we immediately mail out an application. While we have 10 days to work on an application, I'm proud to say in our office, we turn around the applications approximately within two days. Uh, my main concern is when I get in in the morning, if there's anybody on my desk, if I approve them for lunch, they're eating a free or reduced price lunch that day without even the parent being notified. The schools get that information immediately. And I think the other thing that's important too, um, for people that aren't participating, they may not realize that there's no way that their student gets identified either. Absolutely. In other words, they need to know that the kid just goes through the line like everybody else and nobody knows. Because I remember back in when my kids were in school, they were given a ticket. You yeah, know, so it was physically, yeah, yeah. It, it was obvious to other kids that you were getting either a free or reduced lunch. Yeah, the so, overt identification. Right. So, I mean, some people that. may not realize that there's no way that anybody's going to know their kid is getting a free lunch. Yeah. I, I, lunch. I did discuss it with the State Department, and the State Department did say the way we notify parents at the beginning of the school year and constant remind them on the web is probably the best way. 
if we send out applications again, what happens a lot of times, we get applications, that people that already applied, they get a little bit confused. Uh, one of the things that also the state would like us to do here in Wallingford, which I will do, is um, an outreach for children that are on free and reduced price lunch that during the summer months, even though we don't have a program and uh, there could be some discussion how to develop a program, uh, as long as they want me to notify all the schools in a timely fashion where they can go. They can go to a neighboring town. They don't have to show an ID. They can get a free breakfast or lunch, whether it be Meriden or another town that's close by that is offering the service and they're allowed to get it. And when you offer a summer lunch, it doesn't only apply to the children that are in school. It applies to anybody from birth to 18 years of age. If uh, don't even need identification, just go pick up a breakfast and then lunchtime, pick up a lunch. But currently our numbers are too low to have a site. Our numbers, you need 40% for in reduced in a school to do that. So, but I will do an outreach and I'll, I'll get in contact with Meriden so that at, when it gets closer to the end of the year, we will notify our students where their parents can take them for a free breakfast and lunch. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I want to just echo Kathy's uh, sentiment and concern about confidentiality, and maybe that is something that, based on what Dr. Menzo said, yeah, that could come from our administrators um, and their um, communication to their um, families that this is completely confidential and no reason not to take advantage if, if you even think you qualify. So I, I just wanted to echo that sentiment that I, I think that's really important and we, the more we communicate that in a variety of mechanisms, we want to make sure we capture those kids. Because I'm hearing over and over again, our, we've got kids that are hungry in our schools and it, you know, if we can reinforce that, um, I think it's important. Kathy? I, I just want to make one more comment to it. it, it to me this is, a, this is not just about um, helping our bottom line for our, our school, you know, for our food budget um, with the free and reduced lunches. It's, it's been proven that kids that eat right. are gonna do better educationally. Right. And so it's, it's a win-win in both instances. So this isn't just about the money. This is really about making sure these kids are getting a nutritious meal. Anyone else? Yep. Might Jack? be interesting, um, since we have several food service employees here, to see if they have any any other thoughts. Oh, that would be wonderful. Would anyone like to say anything? On, on that, on I think it might be a good idea. Oh, oh I'm idea. sorry. Can you just um, use the microphone? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Karen Sikowski, Food Service Office. I think it might be a good idea if we looked at each school individually and see what is the percentage of free and reduced that are not eating at those schools. Now, I can tell you that I think our 30% sits in the high school. Because if I was 16 years old with $5 in my pocket and a car, I would be at McDonald's and not at eating lunch. And I think that's where our 30% lies, that are not eating, that are on free. And how do you rectify that? I mean, it's very hard. Yeah. And they get out so early. And at she and I school, we only have two lunch You know, they eat lunch at 10.30 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, they're not hungry has, then. Has, and has three lunch waves. And two o'clock, that's what's happening. And I truly do think that's where our 30% is. Yep. And I'm, there's approximately six of the half days we don't even serve at all, and that's been the past president. And maybe you know, down the road, uh, looking into the future, if we do serve, if they come up with a schedule to at least get the children in the cafeteria, uh, the children that are on subsidized lunch won't be embarrassed and have to look the then for lunch. But I think the program will tell us how what school the percentage yeah, is low at. Let's take I a do. look and yep. see what schools they yeah, are. If you can, if you can get that data, that would be It's right on my desk. I look at it every day. So that would be perfect. Yeah. But she's right about the high schools. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very but much. The middle, uh, elementary schools and middle schools are right, basically about the same. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, uh, with the software we have today, we have access to those figures on a daily basis, and it's, it's something that I check, and it, it runs, when we run our, it's called an edit check report, it actually shows you the percentage that is participating, so it's very easy to look up, and I'd be more than happy to bring some of that information to the next board meeting and share it with you. That would, that would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. But those are, those are the students that have been yes, identified yeah, I think as qualifying. What right? Jay is suggesting, capturing more students that yeah, are not right. qualified. Right, haven't been identified yeah. because maybe exactly. the parents aren't aware of it. Or exactly. maybe two, three years ago, or the stigma was always before. Well, they or might maybe not two, have qualified. Three years ago, they didn't like the food. Or yes. they might not have qualified two or, or three years because yeah. the, the adjustment changes. Yeah. And, it, and it goes both ways. We also know that some kid, people don't qualify because they made a little bit more money, not a lot that's making a big difference in their lives. But according to the states, the state and the federal government, it is. So um, I, I think there's the two parts, capturing the people that we already know about and having them encouraged and bring them back to the food because it has improved. Um, and then also capturing new people that we don't know about. And I There's think to reach sides. out with the principals is the right way to go. Yeah, so we could work together on Absolutely. something to provide the principals. Excellent. That's wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Oh, okay. Consensus on the um, cafeteria financial report. Amanda. Yes. 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 And yes. Um, item number three: Board of Education financial report. Just reviewing the uh, financials. First, uh, contingency stays the same. Uh, the transfer are made and the list has no changes on the contingency. Uh, number two, uh, benefits. There's a surplus now of 317,000. Uh, we still have some open positions, so we're still looking at that uh, 317,000. The custodians just signed their contract so we're just look. we haven't done anything on the benefits with them if it's changed. I have not looked at that yet. Number three, uh, the tuition, uh, unfortunately has continued to be a deficit of $938,000. As we discussed before, a couple of things. Uh, we're finding out this year there's a higher tuition rate from the special ed programs. Some of our students are in that higher tuition rate schools. We also have seen an increase uh, approximately about $123,000 in the special needs of magnet school students. Uh, even though the magnet schools, some of the ones that we participate are, are free, some of them, we still have to uh, uh, have programs for this, their needs in, in the special ed program. So that's a real big uh, eye opener for everybody this year of the uh, special needs in the magnet schools. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Rob. Or yeah, the increase this month is primarily due to some of the um, additional special education programming costs for some of our magnet school students, as well as um, we had an additional outplacement. We also uh, we also meet uh, meet with Rob to look at the students that we have now, and maybe uh, have some of those come back. I'm not. A, expert on that but Rob is and uh, we've d Rob has done that too and we do some of the uh, just so the board is aware I, I mean we and I, I've said this many a times that we're always looking to bring students back to district when it's appropriate when we feel we can provide them an appropriate program this week I hope to return two students um, which I case manage so we're going to start that process so hopefully they'll be returned full time in the fall but then students are always moving in as well so just just a heads up for next month we've had just in the past couple of weeks we've had three students moved into Wallingford with with IEPs that are outplaced so um, we need to get to those schools and determine their needs and see if we can replicate the program in district or um, you know it, it's something we're constantly looking at I can promise you that. Jay? Yeah. Whatever our budget ends up being for next year, I think this is a reason that we need to be sure we have a contingency. Mm -hmm. Because right, most all the money, once we go into the year, most all the money is committed to. Correct. And with numbers like this that we can do nothing about, That's true. I think we got to be sure that we retain a reasonable 
contingency. And, and I would just like to inform the board that when we <coughs> did the original projection for this year, last year, we um, projected 80% excess cost reimbursement and we um, utilizing a per pupil expenditure of I think it was 15,440. Correct. Well, we all know that our our threshold has significantly increased about $8,000 per student. So that's a decrease in the amount of reimbursement we're getting that we used to get um, when that threshold was 69,000 versus the 76,000 that it's at right now. Yeah, and, and Rob uh, did a great job at the beginning of the year, and I think you all might remember this from the fall, when we had to make some tough decisions because of students that have presented with more challenging social and emotional um, behavioral challenges. Um, we, we really looked at the data and we said, okay, well, how many of these did we really know about by July 1st? And then we said, how many do we know about by August 1st? How many do we know about by September 1st? With the exception of, I think, I don't think there were exceptions, uh, to be honest. Um, most of them did not come until late in the summer, um, if not September, and we were still receiving students as, well, as you heard recently, but even December. December was a big month, a big increase. People moving in. Yes, and the, and the thing is that, as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this conversation, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? We, when we show our enrollment, and Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we show our enrollment and the re enrollment that gets reported to the, the state, it's those who are enrolled in our schools, not enrolled in outplacements through our schools. <coughs> so that number, um, our number is actually, and we, we probably can do an update, I don't know what the, the exact number is, but our number obviously is higher, is higher, much higher than um, what we're actually saying, because there, there's ones who physically come to our schools and obviously ones who don't, but they're technically all our children that are being paid for through this budget. Mm -hmm. So I think that while we hear our number, our enrollment has decreased, and you know, I sent you out the PowerPoint that we're, gonna, we're working on for the town council, um, our special ed, the impact of our outplacements and, and is, really, is significant. And really, even our magnets, like we have to, we have to provide service will pay for uh, appropriate services for students who are identified with disabilities at their magnet schools. Um, but it's very difficult. I mean, we're not able to project uh, students that we don't know are at our magnet schools when, when they get identified. Obviously, we're part of that process and at the PPT. And then, you know, once the services are put in place. And a lot of those magnet students, because I have to, we have to just um, sign off on proof of residence, um, many of those students start in preschool because the fact is those magnets are in the, home, in the town where their parents work. Yep. So what happens is if their parents are working in New Haven or Hartford, it's much more convenient, and I, I don't disagree with those families, to drop the child off on the way to work, have a full day preschool program, and then let the child stay in that magnet school while you're still working in that community. Um, and so therefore, again, as Rob said, we don't keep, tr when we, they're not on our books. They're, they're claimed by that other school district. Um, so we don't necessarily know what their needs might be as they emerge until we're contacted with the bill, basically, <laughs> um, yeah, the bill. Um, stating know. that we have to provide those services. So we do, um, we do have, and, and I, I know, I, I know that again. It, it's 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 common. It's not just Wallingford. We're people who live in a setting that have magnets, in an, most often in urban settings that have magnets, and it's close to their work environment. It it, it does make sense for the family uh, to do that. So um, that's always another one of those 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 challenges because they also at some point could come back to our district, and we don't know when that's going to happen. Um, and that does happen frequently. So that's why we get those little bubbles in our, in our um, enrollment because sometimes kids, because they, they've never been on the books, but they've always been Wallingford residents, but the parent decides, okay, at this point, they're old enough, they can go to the neighborhood school. Um, but we don't know what's happened before them. Also, just the, the three magnet schools that, we, that they have to attend and so forth, and then the special ed will spend about $517,000 just on magnet schools and the special programs for magnet schools. 
So it's a half a million dollars of, that we're spending. And that's not just wintergreen and tents. No, no, that's the that's whole That's all, yeah. I think it would be very nice to, in next year's budget, to have our enrollment as it's been and then a little side piece that says these are also our kids. Because I, I think until you said that, I had personally had never put two and two together that that number didn't include the students in the yeah. magnet schools. I, I never. Well, because we always have discrepancies when I yeah. run my, uh, my enrollment because mm -hmm. I go all students. And then Karen always politely reminds me, well, wait a minute, their state report only bases on students that are in district, not out of district. Yeah, we actually, the state, so she, it's, it's difficult to tie out to it because they separate students from um, the districts that directly report. So we report our students directly to the state. Our kids that are at, say, an ACES or CREC, any of the RESCs, also report directly to the state. Um, but if they're in a private outplacement, then we report them. So it's complicated. Um, and they have to report our children as us as the nexus or as, as the um, resident district. Um, however, we have to check that because if they don't, they get credit for the student. So it has to be a separate report run and verified. Um, so it, it, is, it is a little tricky to but I can, tie every, all those I numbers together. I think we could even you know, take a look at that for this year because we've already Karen has <laughs> already done she and her staff have done several different reports mm -hmm. that I think we probably can glean the data from mm -hmm. between the two of us and Marie and, yep. and, and such mm -hmm. Roxanne? yeah actually you had my mind that could we even get a sense for this year because yeah. what I'm hearing are um, these students tend to be our costliest students for whatever reason and that's fine um, there are students and we'll own that responsibility that's not what I'm questioning but to give perspective to what it's costing and, and they're not even showing up you know in our numbers per se would be unfortunate so it, it just gives a complete picture yeah. mm -hmm. does, does, does the flip side exist so oh no, we don't have magnet schools oh, oh, and we don't yeah so we don't have the program that we used to have where kids from other town, towns well, could come in. Ex, ex, choice, yeah. Oh, choice students. We have very few left. Oh, okay. We we do. They count in our, when we report our popular student population, they count? Correct. In that yeah. yeah, but we're so down to, I think we're down to, I think we said 11 oh. next year. Yeah, it's really low. We do bill for special ed um, programming costs yeah. for mm -hmm. BOAC kids. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which that's important okay, so that for us to do. Okay, so included in ours. So. Yeah. One of the challenges was going back to the open choice discussion was we were we had a very difficult time billing New Haven. We could bill them, but it was it was virtually impossible to get the money. Yeah, no, billing wasn't your problem. Yes. It was receiving was your problem. <laughs> very um, true. But I think having all that information during budget season, and I know it's a little bit extra, but even no, it's not. Um, would really give a lot of perspective. I know for me personally, I'm sure for everybody else, um, you know. But again, I think you want to show it the other way too, because yeah, I'm gonna bet you, I, not know but I'm gonna guess that the number of non-Wallingford BOAG students exceeds the number of magnet students. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, it's not about the, necessarily the magnet students. This is about all outplacements. Right. So right. the right. number. Yeah, it's really, yeah, yeah so it's, it, it, it probably, it's, it might be a wash, yeah. but we could check yeah. into that. But yeah, no, the, the, um, I think what's, what's really brought all this to the surface is the governor's new funding formula. Right. I think that right. really has made all of us um, look deeper. I mean, I know it's, just not, it's not just Wallingford because, you know, again, on our snow calls, we just don't always talk about snow. We end up going off on different conversations. And I know uh, in our most recent one last Friday, we talked a little bit about an opportunity that actually Rob and... Ed and I are going to have next week. We're meeting with somebody who, and it did get past the first hurdle uh, at the legislative uh, session where they, they had a, uh, it, it seemed like a very positive conversation about a special ed consortium uh, looking at an, uh, a, a projected equalized uh, assessment, so to speak, for a district. We want to hear a little bit more because we're not totally convinced that Wallingford might benefit. We might benefit the first year. Mm -hmm. but maybe not the subsequent years, and if you have to make a multi-year multi -year commitment, it could come back and hurt us. Mm -hmm. um, but we are having a presentation, I believe it's next week, um, to from the woman who's put this formula together, because 
like Jay alluded to, you know, without a contingency, this is such a volatile line item, and it's of no one's fault. Um, it's just the fact that we serve the students, and that's our responsibility. Um, we do the best we can, but it, it's a moving target. And I think we've done very well in the past because we haven't just seen as, we've just seen a, a large increase in enrollment this year with special needs. That's been the case, because in the past we've had enrollment increases, but not with such significant needs. Um, we it, have a lot of movement. Like, we are bringing kids back. It's just programming costs are, are they've really increased, particularly um, for your more involved students with disabilities. Which we couldn't program in our district. Yeah, which we couldn't program for in district. So. Anyone else have any questions? Mm -hmm. The next one is uh, transportation. As you can see, uh, we're going to have a surplus of 320,000. Uh, that's a combination of when uh, Rob, Marianne, and I, and, and special ed uh, uh, met to combine in special ed district transportation and also out of district transportation. Uh, I, I think everybody now is aware of where the kids, are, where the children are going, and they have a better idea of how we can save money. Just for instance, uh, last year. On out-of-district transportation, we spent $1.8 million. This year, we're at $1 million four. So, uh, and then remember, we knocked it down for next year also. So uh, kudos to Mary Ann and to Special Ed uh, to meet and understand where the children are and combining routes, making sure, even out-of-district, making sure that we're having children who can be on the same van. Uh, some kids cannot be on the same van with somebody else. But we've, uh, uh, Rob and his staff have worked on that, so that's, that's uh, kudos to them. So just want to let you know that we're continuing to work on it. We, again, we meet on a monthly basis uh, to go over the costs of special ed tuition and transportation. The next one is salaries. Uh, I put it together, but I want to break it out for you. Uh, certified salaries are showing a surplus about $11,000. Uh, the problem with that, not a problem, I shouldn't say, uh, substitutes. Uh, we're projecting a deficit in substitutes. Uh, we're watching that on a daily basis. The last two years, uh, substitute costs were in 14-15 with 547,000 and 15-16 with 510,000. So we're watching that to make sure we don't spend that. So we're looking at that on a, on a on a weekly basis. And I just want to point out substitutes because I know the public will say, wow, that's a lot of sick people or a lot of people taking time off. Um, with that substitute account covers a variety of things. It's not just about right. sick time or personal time. It's also professional development. We cut professional development a few years ago and moved money from professional development to the sub account so that we could use that money for release time for teachers to work on um, curriculum and such during the day. So. That account isn't about just people being out because of attendance issues, or I don't want the public to perceive that. We, that's not the matter at all. It's the fact that we combined several accounts to put money into that so we could also offer professional de development in that manner. So I just wanted to clarify that. Also, we're looking at which uh, uh, the tutoring account, we always watch that. Uh, right now, uh, we're projecting uh, zero uh, balance, but we're always looking at that. That was a problem last year with tutoring for, uh, for students, we're trying to combine that. They all go to one place, they all go at the same time, they all go on the same transportation. So we're looking at that. And the tutoring account most likely will be one of our next Kaizen events um, regarding lean. Um, that's Rob's goal. <laughs> you see his smile. Uh, he's, he's very, that's his area that he'd like to focus the lean on in that area. Also, just in, in that whole 111 account, we do have some, uh, you know, the waivers were less than anticipated, and the long-term subs are less than uh, anticipated. So in in $45 million budget, uh, we're showing $11,000 surplus. So <laughs> it's tight on that one. Uh, the 1112 uh, budget is showing us a surplus of $153,000. Uh, they are savings, again, in severance. The savings again in security, uh, the two people we have. 
Also, uh, in savings in not hiring on a, the second HVAC employee saved us money. So, in that 112 account, we're showing $153,000 uh, savings. What's not in there yet is uh, what uh, the, the custodial union has, has signed. We have not put in there retroactive and so forth. So next month, uh, th that'll be updated in that account. Just one other thing, if I may mention, just to remind the board and people watching is the 11550 the salary account, certified account, remember, we cut that um, $200,000 going into the school year in anticipation of a certain number and percentage of leaves and long-term absences. So that was um, a reduction ahead of time based on trend. Um, I think we're, from what I understand, those long-term absences are beginning because we have some um, births. <laughs> we just had one recently yeah. uh, around here. Um, and so that we're seeing, we believe that those are going to be uh, coming into more uh, of a reality later this right. spring. The next one, unemployment, uh, we increased that from 150000 to $180,000 surplus. Uh, we're watching that on a monthly basis, uh, and that's how we project on who's out and what's the, what's the remainder. Uh, the Medicare and Social Security, we're projecting a total uh, surplus of $17,151. Uh, we'll know further when we hit our third 941s. And, and the last one is uh, plant maintenance, which looking at, uh, a th which includes plant maintenance and utilities, a $30,000 surplus. Uh, again, as I, in April, we'll look at it for the total. There's three big accounts in there, gas, number two oil, and electricity. Gas is running over budget by about projected 64,000. Number two oil is running over a budget by about $4,900, and electricity is running under budget. So uh, we're trying to get those final figures in by April because hopefully that will we'll get warmer weather by then. <laughs> so that's that. So that gives you a, uh, a total for those accounts of $429,000 surplus. Just let you know, we also... Uh, uh, Wednesday, uh, the 17th, this week, 17th is the last for purchase orders. Uh, they've known that since uh, June, uh, June, uh, January. <laughs> so we're getting in, we're closing a lot of purchase orders that were open. Uh, so uh, the staff is getting in, finalizing all those purchase orders. Yes. And of course, there'll be some emergency purchase orders that, you know, that that old law firm to this, so we're, uh, okay. Jay? Well, yeah, nice, nice job, folks. In the bunch of years I've been on the board now, we fortunately, throughout the year, we've always had positive amounts going through. I read in the paper last week, one of the area towns, I think, has a $900,000 deficit for this year. Ouch. So we take, no, I'm sorry, the Board of Ed. I'm sorry, the Board of Ed. Right now, we just had, we got 400 and some odd, we're projecting 400 and some odd. They right now got, or they're projecting, or they got, or they're projecting 900, no, they got right now, $900,000 loss, so. Thanks. <laughs> Our scary. job as a board would be one hell, <laughs> would be, would be, uh, would be awful if we had to be facing that. Absolutely. God, and the impact on the kids would be awful. Oh, I, yeah. And it's great to have that back. Yes. I'm sure he's going to be saying the same all day tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's all his fault. It yeah. snowed last week. It snowed this week. I ate him. Yeah. You're a snow bird, but you're not supposed to bring the snow with you. <laughs> but it's great to be back. <laughs> oh, we missed just, you. Yeah, just, just like, you know, uh, I'm in Florida on my uh, on our counter that we rent. Uh, there were two computers, and I had to buy a printer. As everybody was calling me, but that was fine. Did it in the morning when my wife was sleeping, and the dinner that after dinner when she was Yeah, water, but wh what else. what day did you choose to call me? Uh, Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> I feel you working five days a week. Saturday, you win. And it was raining in Florida, so what yeah, the yeah. heck? <laughs> so it was no. So we took care of a lot of stuff, which was great. Now we we, we appreciate it. totally appreciate everything. No, no. 
Does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay, consensus on the financial report. Amanda? Yes. 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 And yes. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Absence, opposed, but Mike's going to abstain. Thank you, Mike. Um, oh, the, um, so item number four, proposed theater reservations, um, discussion and possible renovations. actions. Renovations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I We're showing on his We could go for <laughs> renovations, <laughs> but it's all good. Let's all go. I'm so sorry. I'm <laughs> literally four, four hours of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, <laughs> that was quick, Mr. Bono. That was quick. Silver, uh, Dave, Dave Stein from Silver Petroselli is is here to review um, the uh, lighting project with us. Actually, stage renovation project. Uh, before we get started, Dave, I would like to just briefly touch base on. Um, two other big bondable jobs that are currently at Town Hall, just to give you an update. The Sheehan High School HVAC uh, for the cafeterias and kitchen, uh, the bid opening is scheduled for 329.17. Um, that involves uh, air conditioning the entire facility, um, including the kitchen. It includes a new hood for the kitchen, new makeup air unit, new automation. Um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, the second project is uh, the window replacement at Cook Hill, Highland, Parker Farms, and Lyman Hall High School. Another major project. That bid opening is 425.17. Um, that does not include every window. It includes windows that were not done in previous renovations. The biggest thing that you'll see on that is um, the rear entrance to Lyman Hall High School, the student entrance that was not touched in uh, 2007 will be completely renovated. It will give them some more room on the inside of the building. It will give us double doors, so we'll have a, um, a weather break. So we uh, make some improvements there. Um, with that being said, I'd like to welcome Dave Stein from Silver Petroselli. He'll give you a brief overview of the theater project. Can I ask you just one question? Did we approve this? Yes. Yeah, this. Um, yes, this went to the town two years ago um, because the props, um, this was one of the one, one of the items, it's in your budget book, that the mayor approved for bonding um, two years ago, but it required a tremendous amount of design work. So that's why we had to go forward with the design portion. Uh, the mayor approved us to go forward with that. So once we have everything in place, we'll go out to bid, which the bids are being, um, we originally had put together bids last year and then the mayor and the town said, wait a minute, we need a little bit more work on that. So this is about two years now, so that's where um, we're just making sure we're doing it the right way. Okay. Is there a committee that's doing this? Or is, is there going to be a committee? No. no. This is, so we're doing this? No, we're doing it, Mark's coordinating with the actual music, the um, choral people, the drama people, um, and Dave has actually just come off of working on it. What was it, Enfield High School? Uh, Enfield and Berlin High and School. And Berlin High School in the area of theater design. So we were fortunate enough to be able to work with somebody who's been doing this. Great, well, uh, shall I start? Great. Yes. I mean, if, just before, excuse me one mm -hmm. more. If there is a desire on the part of board members to be part of some type of, uh, not necessarily official committee or unofficial, whatever way you want to go, I'm sure Mark wouldn't mind. Um, like we did with the other project for the athletic. Um, but the key people that we wanted to make sure that we got involved in the process, which I'm assuming everybody would agree, would be the teachers that use the spaces um, for the variety of purposes. Will we uh, be, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Will we, how would we uh, be kept abreast of what's going on? Will it be an item on some yeah, our once operations it's a, committee meeting or exact, just a regular board meeting? Um, actually, both. it could be whatever you choose. Last time, once we got the building project done or going for the athletic complex, remember we put it as a, uh, a standing item. Right. Yeah. So that's what we would recommend here is to put it as a standing item and then Mark can report back to the board on a monthly basis yeah. as information. The challenge was that really right now it's been a lot of the technical work. Um, there really hasn't been a lot of, you know, we, none, none of the bids went out, nothing's been approved. So there's nothing to watch. Um, being done, so to speak. 
Um, but the, I have to say the mayor has been very supportive of all these projects, um, and it, as well as purchasing has been very helpful to, uh, to Mark in this process. Roxanne. Thank you. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I have the same concerns, Mike, and or question, not concerns. Um, I, I think I would like to make the suggestion, at least, to do it for our televised, um, I know we're televised now, but the public isn't necessarily, you know, thinking that way. Uh, past practice is always our televised um, at town hall meeting. If we, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about it, but to add that, as an agenda, um, just as a one line or the market sure. update us. And that would definitely go back to our families um, that it might impact. Um, so Absolutely. That, I, that makes sense to me. Yeah, it seemed to work well with the, the field project. Right. Because you never know, questions might come along. Right. Care about that. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's a big project, too. I mean, it, from a financial perspective, too. So it would be nice to keep everybody apprised to it. You're right, Mike. The strong aspect of our staff is that our music department is very tight. Yeah. And um, with, their, with their coordination and their understanding, and they're very close with the people who do drama in their schools. So I know Mark, I kept saying to him, now, did you meet with everybody? And he's like, yep, we got everybody. They, I think they felt very, I, all I've heard is they felt very respected through this sure. whole process. Um, which I think during the previous renovation, they kind of, the, the auditorium didn't necessarily always get equal say. Yeah. So I think that that was a concern of theirs going into this. And I think that I would have to say that they felt very, um, you know, respected um, through this process thus far. Well, the issue with the last one is the money ran money. out. I mean, yeah. It ch kept changing and it, the cost kept going right. up. So that's exactly. The if this is pretty much. This looks good. Well, I think also the scope of work changed, and that's why the pricing changed. But um, this probably has uh, got more of a finite. Um, Dave, True. did you did Silver Petrocelli uh, actually bid on um, the? So I assume you guys bid on the project in its totality. Yes. So you're in your 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 firm is in from beginning to end um, on this. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. if so, if you want, I could give you just a sure. general scope of really what this entails and talk to you about the process of when we started. So we did submit for an RFP. Um, we were t we are teamed with theater projects out of South Norwalk. They are a um, well-known theater theatrical design firm who has done K through eight work, um, higher ed and very professional work throughout the state. Most of their work is in Manhattan, but they do uh, a lot of work with us on the K through 12 marketplace. We just came off of two projects that Dr. Benzo mentioned, Enfield High School and Berlin High School. Enfield is a renovation of their existing facility. Berlin was brand new. Essentially, we demolished their building and ground up. So we had that core experience of taking that uh, especially while students are in school and trying to adapt that through a very narrow window of trying to get this work done. Um, so our, we, we approach this by first going through and just looking at this through our own lens of evaluating all four of the schools and we're talking about the two high schools and the two middle schools. Um, I personally live in town, I've had experience working in these um, on community events and so forth, so I know how important this is to the community um, and assessing just the overall infrastructure. The bones of all of the theaters are in good shape, but really the accessories that go along with it that I'll talk a bit about, that's really original type of equipment that at times can be unsafe when it is in the hands of people that are not familiar with that type of technology and that's really what you want the goal to do is to put those tools in the hands of the students so they can learn from those um, you know from those experiences you just don't want it to be given to the adults to work and manage to get the full educational 
experience. So uh, we went in, we um, took all the existing documentation that was done from the school, some of it original documents that go back to when each of the buildings were built. Uh, we put those into our computer systems and we sort of mapped out the overall size of the building. And then we, are with our co theater consultant, went in and looked at all the pieces of equipment. And from there, once we kind of had a framework of what was there, we met with the educators from each four of the schools and we did that together. We actually met with them individually while we walked through their schools. But then we met as a group because the goal here is that anything that we're doing has a common place for each of those, especially lighting. Uh, lighting that potentially a light could be used in one space versus the other. So there's some transportability of that. So we have a system that is consistent. The last thing you want to have is um, mixing and matching of technology. So the compatibility of the lighting systems is an important piece of it. But really it's broken down and if you get into the proposal, we've broken it down really into the core piece which is the theatrical rigging piece. And what that is, that really holds all of your draperies, all of your lights, anything and so forth. We don't have theaters that are high enough that we really are able to lift things and move things around like you would see in some schools. Um, so we're somewhat limited when we say rigging, but essentially that's the structure that holds up all of that. And that really needs to be fully replaced and um, taken down with, um, that gives you now the ability to actually drop any of that stuff or so it would be motorized because right now most of that needs to be accessed by a lift or unfortunately a ladder and you're up there at 15 feet in the air and it's just unsafe to be working on you know that heavy equipment so what we want to do is a system that will drop the equipment down so it could be basically it changed out right there um, right there on the stage itself um, and then any of the controls that work with that. Um, we're also looking at decommissioning some equipment that currently exists. There's some equipment such as fire curtains and things like that that are no longer required by code. So you also are then required to maintain them and, observe, uh, yeah, and continually look at those every year and that's probably an expense that you may not need to do. So we're looking at decommissioning equipment that may be working but may not be um, best in terms of long-term uh, maintenance. The theatrical drapery, which is the show curtain and all those other draperies, some of those have been, uh, there are fairly new, they're not necessarily original, um, but you also, if they're not documented every year, there's a question of whether or not they really lose their fire rating. And that's really essentially what it is, is a special fire rating that you need. So we're looking at, uh, and this is all based on budget of whether it makes sense to do a full replacement or just replace pieces and parts of those overall item. Um, hold on one second. Mike, you have a question? Yeah, yes. Uh, can you just go back over that again? Sure. But I know the drapery, the outside curtain. Show curtain, yeah. They're, they're fairly new, but not that old. Yeah, and, and that's correct. So. Um, we're gonna look at some of those draperies. That may just be the front one, but right. some of the aprons, some of the side valances and such, those are the ones that if they do not have some of the tags on it or documentation, then we would look at recommend recommending to remove a portion of them. But yes, there are some that remain. I think we mentioned that within the, within the report. Um, the theatrical lighting is the big piece of it and as you know what's happening with lighting design everywhere is it's moving to LED technology which um, is much more energy efficient um, it's safer because it's not as hot because currently those lights are pretty they burn really hot and you could get burned even just touching them so um, all of the lighting would be reduced to that which is nice because it's less of electrical draw um, which will essentially mean our main power service doesn't require upgrades. We are going to need to upgrade all the source electrical that goes into that um, because of just the, um, just the age of it. Some of it is old plug technology that's, that, um, uh, that, that just really needs to be upgraded. So the biggest piece is the head end equipment, the controls, of all that, the software that goes into it, that, that allows you to control it and lock it out. Um, as you know, you use your facilities also for community events who rent those spaces. Mm -hmm. 
So it's important to have the technology that limits the use of those community. You could lock them out or at least only give them user preference. And that's the challenge. You, you, if you build all of this, you want to protect it because it could easily be just manipulated. Um, so you got to be careful. And um, so the new technology allows you to do all of that. And then in terms of that lighting, those individual fixtures could be interchangeable if needed. So if one broke, <laughs> it could be transported over to another school. Um, so that's the big piece of it. And then the last piece is the audio video technology. As you know, you're using these theaters not only just for the times that there is a large event. The schools are using these for educational uses. At Moran, there's classes that are going on there where they're using teams are going in and using this and bringing in projection screen. In some cases, new projection screens have been, have been bought. Um, those will need to be reworked and um, reworked with projectors that tie into that. Um, so the AV piece of it, the sound and the audio is a critical piece to improve in the overall piece of the theater. We're also looking at just improving some acoustics that will go with it. The last thing we want to do is put together a great audio system, but it just doesn't sound great, okay? So we're gonna look at some areas where we can do minor architectural improvements as opposed to a full renovation of the space um, to complement it because we just don't wanna be disappointed that the sound just it may sound worse with something that's better amplified, actually. So that's the last thing we want to do. Um, and then we're also looking at emergency in terms of house lighting uh, and how that ties into the fire alarm system and such, because there's some work that needs to be done in terms of the code. Um, so that's kind of a general overview of what this entails. This is really just our first schematic narrative. Um, and our next step is to take this and put together a engineering document that we can then get ready to go out to bid and bid to um, really contractors, not just a theatrical lighting guy because there's a lot of components that will go along with this that we need a general contractor to be able to do this. We also need a general contractor who has the ability to manage these four projects because we need consistency of product, we need consistency of management. Uh, we're also gonna be looking at a schedule on how we roll out this project. Um, we think our recommendation is to do the high one high school, one middle school at one time, and then work on to the next. It's lessons learned that we'll have from just the techniques and the means and methods that go into a construction project, similar to your roof projects that we didn't embark on all of those at one time. So the goal would be to begin this summer and then the work into the early fall so it is ready and does not disrupt the major programs, especially the productions, theatrical productions that begin to go on sort of mid-fall and so forth. So there's a lot of work to do to get this to a document out the bid and then manage the construction project. But yes, we will be there to help shepherd that through and essentially be your technical representation throughout the project. So we'd be glad to come back and give you updates on where we are with the process at the end of construction or where bids are and so forth and tell you, you know, where we are. We'd be happy to give you periodic updates. I think our next step right now is a goal for us is to have those drawings ready in about a month. Um, probably about four to six weeks to be able to do that, get those prepared, work with purchasing, and get them on the street for a public bid. Just um, Karen, then I think. So sure. Karen? Um, yes, I'd like to know, could you just in a very brief way mm. give us some of the concerns that you have for modifications for acoustics, especially as regards musical productions? Yeah, so, um, you know, acoustics is a tough one because we all hear <laughs> a, a little differently. Um, so um, actually, Sheen's acoustics are, are, are pretty good, and that's coming from the ear of our theatrical designers, so I'm taking their word for what they hear. Um, Lyman Hall's a bit pingy in terms of that, so some thoughts that we would do is maybe put some sound panels actually on the back wall, and that's really, some people think you wanna sort of put them on the sides. We really want 
to look at the back walls of the theater mm -hmm. and just apply, you know, basically insulated panels. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing very sophisticated to do that. Maybe some that are hung in certain positions. It just sort of dampens the reverberation, essentially, that happens in a room. So it's not overly complicated, but it needs a little bit of manipulation to look at. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Roxanne? Yeah. So Dave, what's your, uh, going back to your last comments on timelines, um, I, that makes sense to do one side of town and then the other side, w whatever is first, second, whatever. So what are we looking at? Um, and I, I understand it being summer projects makes perfect sense. Are we aggressive enough? Can we get these done in one summer or is this multiple summers? Well, I think there was some, the initial thought is to actually start, in, uh, start and do the first one, which would be June, July, and August, and then go into the next one into September, October, November. Oh, okay, okay. And that works in terms of for the high schools, two. say that again? Two. Well, it, well, they two would do one, one side of town, in other words, so Sheehan and I guess Moran would be, whether that's June, July, you, August, and then September, October, November would be the other side, you know, Lyman so Hall, Matt, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, and Dad, yeah. Yeah, I oh, think yeah, we'd yeah, want yeah. them both but done you go you we both want them to done. We would both want, for example, Sheena Moran should be done at the same time. Right, and right. Our, that makes sense. Which makes sense. Right. You know, they could be managed right there. They could store right. materials and so right. forth. Right, so. right. But our, I just want for clarification, because I have the same question I think okay. Mr. Votto had, is that they would both, all four would be done by the fall, or would two right. be done by the fall, and then the other two oh, in the fall? Yeah. The, the, goal, the goal initially was that all would be done by the fall. Okay. That we would and not be going into 2018. All right, that's right. what I thought, but I just wanted, I didn't yes. mean to assume and, that and that was a question, but I just, I thought that was clear. So whatever side of town is going into the fall, that's not, that's going to be okay in terms of, yeah, obviously students are back, and that's not ideal, but um, that's acceptable for our schools and our staff and for yeah we have folks. to work out the calendar because right. we did when we did speak with the educators there were some things that were already sort of planned right at the tail end of sure. that so what we're gonna need to implement those into the bid okay. documents so, so you're already thinking about need it to know we're hoping there may be things that we can phase in yep. also so some of them may over there may be some overlap even though we really don't want them all to start at the same time, yeah. there may be some overlap. The big piece is going to be the procurement of it. We want them to procure all the materials up front so we have it, so there's not a sourcing issue. That's always a concern with multiple stage projects mm. is just the procurement piece of it. But um, it's a tight time frame, but the mm. goal is to, to do this within 2017. Thanks. And the, the key would be just, and I think as Dave alluded to, is that Moran would have to be in the first phase of it because it is a teaching classroom, the auditorium. So we would need to make certain that that was ready for so day one. Make, uh, Moran, she and Most the likely, first, more likely the first set. because of the, the classroom space that's being used. DAG mm -hmm. has a separate choral room. So there's not as much of a, a, an impetus that it needs to be done by the first day of school, but Moran, it would be necessary. I, I just have a question. Um, you guys had talked about the sound and the architect. Um, is the ceiling in the theater a DAG included <coughs> in, in kind of what you looked at? Because if I'm not mistaken, wasn't there a problem with the ceiling in the DAG auditorium? It needs to be painted big time. Oh, I thought there was like a hole or something. I, last yeah, time there, I was there, there was some issues. There was, because there was some issues when, well, Mark, you. There, there was a moisture <laughs> issue and um, it, it has to do with uh, a curb on the roof, and we're remedying that problem. And then we have money in the budget to refinish that ceiling. That ceiling will not be part of this project mm -hmm. unless that day finds a reason to uh, modify it for acoustics or something else. Okay. But I think what I heard is that you are that we're not going to fix everything else and then leave the ceiling the way it is. There is money in this year's budget. That's correct. To, okay. Okay. Yeah, because I was a little okay. worried we're going to do all this work, and now I knew there was an issue, and. We also have a concern about the, um, and I don't know if it's part of the project, but the walls in Sheehan, the, um, those lovely beige, whatever they're made out of walls, um, I think that was something that we wanted to remedy also. Similarly speaking, Shauna, that we didn't want to do all this great stuff and then go, still go in there and say, what did they do? Yeah. Uh, well, and I was concerned because, like, I, I thought I remembered that it was yeah. a water issue, and I'm like, okay, now we're putting all this new electrical stuff in, and we still have a hole. 
But okay, I'm glad to hear that's being taken care of. Thank you. We just need carpeting now too. We got to work on that one. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Kathy? Yeah, so I'm probably dating myself here because I'm sure this is probably not an issue anymore, but I remember back in the old days, um, it used to be that when you, re when you had to replace one light bulb, yes. or you did them all because of the complexity in um, getting to the lights and all that. Yes. Is that no longer an issue? Are they, is yeah, it well easy enough to replace one light if it goes up because the LEDs are expensive and mm -hmm. How's that work? Yeah, well, uh, two things. The beauty of LEDs is the lifespan is yeah, a thousandfold um, in terms of well, what yeah, you would no, have I, now. I have a lot of LED lights <laughs> okay. in my life that don't do okay, don't right. hold up. Fair so. enough. I think you know, in terms of the theatrical lighting, in terms of the hours that they actually run compared to what we have, I agree. The technology is still is, is still improving. Um, all of that lighting rigging, whether it's actually over the, what we call in the front of the house, which is actually over the audience that projects in or on the stage above, will be motorized. Okay, okay. so that's, it, it resolves a safety issue and mm. then gives you the ability to change out those lights. Okay, and one, one other question. Um, with respect to the microphones that the, um, the actors actually yes. wear, yes. Um, with this new, assisted li listening system they'd be th would we have to get new microphones or would the ones we have already work no well so, so you already in some of the schools you already own body mics that go along with um, which we can tie into that same type of frequency microphone so we're not there is already a list that came and I, I didn't mention that there is a list of equipment that uh, the educators had given to us and said, you know what, this is fine, we could live with this. Could you integrate that into our system? In some cases we said, yes, it's new, but it's really not the best fit. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna be able to repurpose those in other locations. So it's not like equipment is being tossed that was already purchased. But going back to your question in terms of the mics, a majority of those will be able to be repurposed and then yes those will tie back into assisted listening and other recording devices so are we required to do any action for tonight I mean I see it listed as an actionable item but I didn't know if that was a catch-all I, I just kind of did it just yeah in that's case. fine I didn't know what mark was looking for tonight so no, I didn't want to miss an opportunity no no action okay uh, great. this was just informative yeah, that's great um, and we'll keep everyone abreast of anything that's going on. We have consulted everyone involved in this from teachers to uh, drama people, um, and we're gonna continue to consult with them. Right now we have feelers out. They looked at the basic design and they're, they're giving us more information back, so uh, we, we haven't left anyone out. Mike? Uh, you just brought up another question. So in other words, the people involved in this, the teachers and whatnot, they're gonna be kept in the loop all the time, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Because things are gonna change, you know, as, as, as this mm -hmm. progresses. Uh, and, I, and I think they should be aware of that, that if there are going to be any changes in the original design. Um, and if I'm, I, forgive me if I don't remember, what was the total cost of this? Uh, we, Estimated total cost. The, the cost is confidential at this time. We oh, can't, yeah, we can't get that, give that out to the public. Right. Um, as soon as it's bid, we'll, we'll let everyone know. Okay. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. You're we welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. So unless there is anything else that anybody has to say, I'd like to adjourn this meeting. <laughs>